Hello? My voice isn't very loud, so I have to use the microphone today. I didn't, I didn't use the microphone yesterday, unfortunately, and so I, I was unable to talk last night, but it didn't bother my wife any. Um, we were talking today about uh, a new BMP, a potential new BMP that uh, they're creating in the county of Spokane, and we'll have three speakers. They didn't tell me much about them except for their names. I have Jake Saxon, Dr. Amy Navicus brash and Taylor Hoffman-Ballard. And they're going to speak in that order. Enjoy. All right. So as, as Doug said, I'm, I'm going to tip this up, actually. Yeah. So as Doug said, I'm Jake Saxon. I'm with Spokane County. Um, I am going to start out. I'm going to give some background on why, I guess, why we're doing this, why, why we're coming, doing this study. Um, I guess what motivated us to go down this path. Uh, Amy will give a bit of a study overview and then go into the column testing and then uh, Taylor will uh, get into the field monitoring portion and answer all the questions. So. <laughs> so one of our main motivations for wanting to come up with a new BMP was for uh, stormwater retrofits in built urban areas, um, specifically areas like this. Um, we have minimal setbacks. Uh, there's not a whole lot here. This particular house has some off-street parking. That's not exactly the case going down this road. Um, this is actually one of the sand filter vaults that's installed. Um, but what we've, what we've got is since they're built out, there's just not a whole lot of room. Um, it's not really reasonable to go take more right away. Um, and so even where there is right away, um, Generally, there's a lot of built features uh, where the topography is poor. Like in this case, we've got a retaining wall um, at, the back of the, at the back of the existing right away. We've got signs out there. So even if we were to go out and start uh, acquiring right away, we'd be, not only would we be buying um, expensive urban property, but we would also be purchasing any improvements that are behind there or rebuilding them. And so that's uh, quite a bit of cost before we even get started down the road of building anything. Um, so moving on. Uh, so with those kind of challenges, it's essentially a space challenge. Um, we have a couple different options. Like we have uh, some proprietary products that are um, vault products that would fit these needs. Um, but as many of you probably know, these are expensive, um, both on the front end and then also in the maintenance aspect, a lot of them have um, maintenance that is required on the six-month or yearly interval. Um, and then uh, we do have some existing BMPs uh, in our Eastern Washington Manual that are, are similar type thing. Um, sand filters, they, uh, the problem with what we have is the low infiltration rates that are approved. Um, and they end up resulting in uh, large, large areas that are similar to uh, bioretention swales. And therefore, if we had room for, for bioretention swales, we wouldn't be, we would be building bioretention swales. Um, so from there, we kind of moved that we wanted to develop something that was in a small and simple vault. Um, I don't know how many, how many of you guys here are from the Eastern Washington. Yeah. All right. So, so where we're at, and especially in Spokane County, a lot of what we do is infiltration for disposal. We're not um, putting big pipe systems in and discharging places. We're putting in dry wells. Um, so every block, we're we're just all our disposals in dry wells. So we needed something that we could put reasonably put, like at at the end of every block, uh, with every dry well, every disposal structure. So we wanted a small, simple vault. And then um, something that, yeah, that we, we kind of, we came up with that if we, if the maintenance uh, intensity is low enough on these, that we would, we could handle maintaining them a little more often. But, um, you know, if, if only if it's something that's quick. And that's kind of drove our simplicity of these. And uh, so th this is what we came up with. Um, essentially, we have a direct inlet 
from the roadway uh, right here. This is the cross section of it. This is where our runoff is coming in. Um, again, there's no, there are not again, but there's, there's no pre-treatment on these. And so that's, that adds to the kind of the simplicity of these that we don't, we're, we're not, we don't have to have the vector out to maintain these where we could maintain these by hand uh, is kind of the idea. Um, so as water comes in, then we've got this, uh, our first layer is the coconut coir mat. And what this is, it's, a, it's actually a product, you may have seen it at the storm con or here, it, that it's a, kind of a woven about two inches thick mat that uh, you put over inlets when you're sweeping. And what, what this allows us to do is anything that, any, any uh, debris that accumulates on top of here, we can actually clean off and then roll it up in the mat. And then the sand underneath that is in pretty good shape. So that's, that kind of gets to where the maintenance is fairly easy to do. And then um, below that mat is our coarse sand for our higher infiltration rate. And I think that, uh, that pretty much covers where my portion of it and why we wanted to do this. So I'll pass it off to Amy for the study overview. Okay. So now I'm going to start taking a look at um, existing or typical sand filters compared to the new sand filters so you can get an idea of what we're trying to develop and how it's different from what's currently in the ecology manual. Um, so this is just a comparison to some of the key characteristics of these two BMPs. Um, for the sand filter media, both of them have an 18-inch media depth. We're not changing that at all. Um, both have a max ponding depth of 18 inches. What that means is that the bypass pipe is set 18 inches higher than the media, the top of the media. And so when we're designing these sand filter, either BMP, you're designing it to treat the water quality event. And so we want to make sure that we don't have any overflow during a water quality event that it can actually pond and then infiltrate in. Um, so those larger events are handled by the bypass or the overflow. Um, for pretreatment, as Jake mentioned, um, we don't have a pretreatment cell set up with them. Where that is common with the existing sand filters, there's a pretreatment cell for gross solids to settle out and then water overflows into the treatment cell for treatment. Um, so we started with none, and Taylor will explain how this went for us. And so um, we did end up having to do some modifications to provide some pretreatment because that didn't quite work as well as we'd hoped. Uh, another big difference is the sand gradation itself. Um, we, the existing sand filter BMP uses a medium grade sand, which is finer than the coarse grade sand that we're using. Uh, what that gives us is a significantly higher infiltration rate compared to what the existing sand filter BMP has by more than 10 times or 100 times. And so the result from that um, larger uh, gradation media is that we have a higher porosity, we have a higher, um, and we can get that infiltration. We can get a much larger contributing basin area going to this BMP than we would with a traditional sand filter. Um, so how we achieved our goal with developing a new BMP was through two parts. The first part was a column testing, and the second is the field study. The column testing is done, field testing is underway. The goal of the column testing was first to select the media that we were going to use in the field, try to pick which one, and then assess the treatment performance of it. We want to figure out in the lab where it's cheaper if it appears it's going to meet the treatment performance requirements that ecology requires, and if not, make adjustments there so it's not as expensive when you get in the field. And then we also wanted to define the um, BMP design and maintenance guidance. So with developing a new BMP, we're going to go be going through the tape process and we have to define that in the application. So we wanted to be able to define that um, at the column testing phase. So the field testing started in the fall and is underway and this is the part where we're actually demonstrating the treatment performance. This is the part that counts for tape. The column testing doesn't actually count. Um, we're looking at TSS, dissolved metals, copper and zinc, and also oils. And we're also verifying the BMP design guidance and maintenance guidance. Does it look the same as what we saw in the columns? Because the columns tend to be more um, ideal conditions compared to the unpredictable situations that happen in the field. So a little bit about the testing methods we used for the column testing. Um, we had two inch diameter columns that were clear. I like clear columns because then I can see what's happening <laughs> um, as uh, stormwater is flowing through the column. Um, we used 18 inches of sand media and we packed it in the columns exactly the same way the county is going to pack them in the field using water. So we'd fill it up six inches and then flow water through it the same way. Another six inches of media, pour water through it to pack it down with water. Um, 
Then we simulated rainfall events um, using a, compos a stormwater composition of tap water and then chemical standards to get the pollutant concentrations that we're expecting in the field. And we put it in this aquarium. And it was continually mixed with a mixer just to keep the solids from settling so they would be flowing through um, the pump that we used that distributed um, stormwater to each of the columns. And we distributed columns at a flow rate of 1.6 gallons per minute per square foot of the treatment area um, of the columns. The pollutant lo lo loading that we added was equivalent to what we expected in the field at the site. Um, and for the volume, it was about 40 inches of rainfall. Each event we ran was one inch of rainfall, which is equal to the water quality event in Eastern Washington. Um, and we, the volume then from that scaled was for um, an 18,000 square foot contributing basin area. And so we scaled that down from what the BMP would be in the field with a 20 square foot area down to that two inch diameter column. So it was that contributing equivalent to the 18,000 square feet in the field. The data we collected was water quality samples. We collected influent and affluent, like at the equivalent of three months worth of rainfall, six months, kind of just kept going at different intervals with the six month interval all the way up to about 40 inches. Um, and then we also measured the infiltration rate. We wanted to see how is the infiltration rate changing over the duration of the testing period. And this is what we got. So over here we have the precipitation depth. Again, we ran it in these one inch increments up to 40 inches. And these are the parameters that we tested, TSS, dissolved copper, dissolved zinc, and total phosphorus. Phosphorus, we didn't add anything for phosphorus. We really just wanted to know, is it leaching phosphorus? That was the question there. Um, the first rainfall event we had, we had 120% leaching, and that was it. So probably something in the sand that we had had some phosphorus in it and flushed out. And when you're doing the testing, you're not washing everything you're using. You're not washing the sand to get everything else out. So that's not surprising to see that. Um, with the other parameters that we had, uh, TSS, we had about an 80%, 81% reduction was just a smidge higher than what ecology requires for an 80% reduction. Um, copper, we hit about 74%, which is significantly higher than the 30% required to hit. And then with dissolved zinc, we only hit 58%, which is just slightly lower than the 60% were required. So just, I mean, again, this was to assess what are we thinking we might be able to see in the field based on these conditions. And so we see some promising results that will help kind of move us forward. One of the trends that we saw in the data, though, is that we have this decline in the TSS reduction as we're going through. So let's take a look at that. So this is the TSS plotted. Um, on the y-axis, we have the affluent concentration divided by the influent concentration. So if we were at one, that would mean the affluent is equal to the influent. So there's no change in the pollutant concentration. If we're all the way down uh, near zero, that means almost all the pollutant was removed. Uh, the red line is the 80% reduction that ecology requires, so we want to try to, on average, be below that line. And for most of the initial tests, we were. When we hit about the 34th event, that's when we sprang up, and our reduction, our performance for TSS reduction was declining. And what we see is the trend is the trend is it's declining over time, which is a little interesting. Typically with like the medium gradation and some of our bioretention BMPs, what we see is as TSS goes in, it clogs the surface, and the infiltration rate goes down, but TSS gets to a point where it can't go through because you've got a clogged surface. So seeing this trend go up is kind of the opposite. So we explored that a little bit more. And so um, let's take a look at the columns. When we started the columns, this is just 18 inches of sand. You can't really just see the dark colored media in it. What we expect to see is as time goes on, that TSS will accumulate primarily on the surface. Um, the TSS media that you use in the lab is silco sil, and it's white, which is awesome because the sand is dark and you can see the difference between the two. So we expect to see this pile up on the top and permeability declining. That's not quite what we were seeing. Because of the higher porosity, what we're seeing is a little bit of buildup on the surface. And then if you can see this in the column, the pores of the sand are starting to fill up with a TSS because it's got that higher porosity. And what's happening is over that, when we hit that 34th year, 34 inches, we're starting to see what came in is starting to come out. So, um, but we still had decent infiltration. And then we started looking at what's happening in the field. So this is actually Jake's feet. <laughs> He's standing on top of the sand filter. Um, and it was already in the field installed before we began, got the equipment in and set up. And so what he was seeing was 
over that year, he was seeing clogging. He was seeing that the surface, the sediment built up a good two or three inches, and that then you have clogging and really slow permeability, which is a lot different than what we're seeing here. So the gradation of the media here, remember, there's no pretreatment. So every worm, every piece of, you know, every cigarette, every shirt, I mean, there's all kinds of things that we found in there. Um, I think we found a dead mouse in one of them. God bless that intern um, <laughs> who found that. So we went out and, and we picked up the media out there, dried it, um, and brought it back into the lab, and we did it again. So we repeated the column testing with the TSS, and then we talked to Jake, who had the setup at several sites, and he said, okay, I think this is how much sediment accumulation you're getting. So we used Jake's rule of thumb to estimate that sediment, dried it, and then we re-ran it. So the flu line is what we were getting with just the Silco sill. And so permeability is declining over time. But even at this 40, you know, the event 40 here, um, we're still like at 300 inches per hour. So really high with the infiltration rate. Then we repeated it with that um, larger gradation media too, and we see this really radical decline that goes down significantly faster. And that point where these two cross right here, that's 124 inches, that's the point where we can only get up to that 18 inches of ponding essentially, where we're treating the water quality then. So this is really the end life for us here, is at that 10 month point. So it's looking like at about, after 10 inches of precipitation, we're going to need to have maintenance done to replace, um, to rejuvenate um, the surface of it for the study that we were doing. So that's what we were initially seeing. Um, this is good. So Taylor will take you through. We did go ahead and go out in the field at that point. Even though we were lo it was looking like this was going to be a challenge, we were already set up to go. And we thought, well, let's see, because it seems to be clogging much faster in the lab than what Jake thought he was seeing in the field. So we decided to go ahead and proceed to see what we, we got. So Taylor will take you through that. So I'll be giving a summary of the field testing as well as some of the initial results that we saw. Our field testing started in fall 2018. Um, it's going to cover two wet seasons. The data that we're going to be collecting includes flow-weighted influent and effluent samples, saturated hydraulic conductivity, and precipitation data. So this is our site in the photo on the bottom half of the slide. Whoops. Um, right here you can see this is the catch basin that receives drainage from our drainage area. It's um, built without a sump, so no free treatment. And then in the upper right-hand photo we have the influent pipe called out by number two. The effluent pipe is below that, um, and that's called by the number six. And then we have the actual sand filter vault here with influent pipe coming in and the bypass pipe. So this is before we installed any of the monitoring equipment we um, used to collect samples, uh, measure flow. So these are examples of some of the um, automated equipment that we installed in the vault. We have samplers and data loggers to automatically collect samples during rain events. We also had uh, weirs and pressure transducers located in the influent and effluent pipe to measure flow and to tell us when we needed to collect samples. And then we had a rain gauge located on site um, to measure rain exactly at the site. So this slide is meant to kind of give a description of the test site and why we selected it. The test site is located in Spokane, Washington, which is a semi-arid area and has about 16 inches of rain annually. Um, one of the reasons why we chose this location was it's downslope of a signalized intersection, so we should see a lot of stop and go traffic for those 15,000 vehicles that we see each day. Um, we also picked this because there's the, oops, I'm gonna do that a few times. Um, our sand filter is located right here. And so we're receiving this 18,000 square feet. And there's a sand filter also located right here. And we closed that in order to allow 36,000 square feet towards our sand filter site. We did that because we wanted to make sure that our influent was dirty enough that we could assess the effectiveness of this VMP and to meet our um, peak inflow requirements due to the tape design guidance. So our initial percent removal results are shown up on this slide. Um, for TSS, we got about 67%. Dissolved copper was 35%. Dissolved zinc was 34%. And then we had a total phosphorus reduction of about 35%. And this is over three months of data collection. 
in terms of flow, for the first rainfall event, or at the very beginning of our testing, we saw results more like what you see on the left over here, where the effluent is very closely following the influent. And these graphs show cumulative volume. So we have volume on the y-axis and then duration of the storm on the x-axis. And we don't have any bypass. And then as the months went on, we started to see more of a pattern of um, the effluent dropping. And we were seeing basically standing water in the sand filter and bypass occurring. So that was indicating to us that we were having clogging occur. Some of our initial conclusions are that field is actually matching what we saw in the column testing. We're seeing that surface clogging that we saw in the columns when we added in the grit from the sand filter. Um, we're also seeing bypass flow during events that are less than the water quality event. So this would cause us to have to basically maintain this more frequently each year than we'd like to be maintaining it. So we decided that we needed to make some modifications to the BMP. So the first thing that we're thinking about doing is we're going to be reducing that contributing basin area to the 18,000 square feet from the 36,000 square feet. So if you remember from the previous slides where we had those two basins coming in, we will reopen the upstream sand filter and allow that upstream 18,000 to go into that one. So we are only receiving 18,000 square feet at our sand filter that we're monitoring. And then the second thing that we are thinking about doing is adding in the um, inlet that's receiving water from our drainage area is adding an upturned elbow. It doesn't have a sump, so we're going to place an upturned elbow to hopefully settle out some of those gross solids, like Amy was talking about, the worms, the mice, the, the shirts that we pulled out of there, um, all of the lovely things. So those are kind of our modifications that we're proposing at this point. At this time, do you have any questions? And I won't be the only one fielding. 